Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to the PMF IS Current Affair Prelims Test Series and my name is Ashish Malik. We are going to discuss test number 2 which was conducted on 15th of the February. So in this first part of the video, we are going to discuss and make you understand how to approach the questions and this is about the first 20 questions that was in your test. Let us get started and let's see what was the questions all about. The very first question that was asked in your test series was about the temple architecture in India. Now this is a very very basic and important questions. So if you are, if you have covered your art and culture slavers, temple architecture is one of the most important topics that you should pay attention towards. The question was very simple. It was simply about the three major styles of temple architecture of India, namely the Nagara style, the Dravida style and the Visara style. Before I get into the details, you should be aware of that the three styles have very distinct areas in which they are applied in terms of temple architecture. If you look at India and if you have, if you have understood where the Vindhyan ranges are, so every part which is uh, on the towards the north of Vindhyan ranges we have the Nagara style of temple architecture and for Nagara and for north that you can remember and all the uh, areas which is south of the Vindhyans which is, which is called the Dravida area the southern uh, part of India there we have the Dravida style of uh, temple architecture. Somewhere in central India somewhere in this particular region we have a blend of the two which is a hybrid model and that was developed as Visara temple architecture. So it, it was a very straightforward question, nothing complicated. But before I begin, you should be aware of the basic facts of these particular styles. You talk about the north style, which is the Nagara style. And there I have mentioned that it is, it is all about the Panch Yatan style. What is the Panch Yatan style of temple uh, architecture? Where in the center, you have the temple of the main deity, that is the main shrine called as the Garb Griha. And on the four sides, you have the sub shrines or you can call them as subsidiary shrines. shrines. Um, uh, you can also call them as mandap. Now that is a very basic feature of the Nagara style of architecture. These four belong to four cardinal directions and there is a rectangular layout which is very basic for the Nagara style. You can actually see this style here in this particular picture, very evident. Uh, this is the normal plan of a Nagara style of temple architecture. Now. <clears throat> Whenever you are preparing uh, topics which, which are very similar to the same topic and there are subtopics, it is always preferable you always try to revise them in a comparison form as a table comparison. So we have the Nagara and the Dravida style. Their locations we already have mentioned into the north and south. Nagara always have a central tower and the name is called Shikhar. The shape of the Shikhar is always like a, a curvilinear, like something, something of this kind of shape. Okay, this is very common in any northern temple you see. Similarly, for Dravida style, there is a central tower, but that uh, uh, Dravida style has a temp uh, central structure in the form of a Viman, something like this in a pyramid kind of structure. Also, remember in Nagara style of temple architecture, there is, there is not much uh, importance given to any boundary walls. You don't have any boundary wall or something like that. Also, there is, there is no water tank inside the complex that is something very uh, very common in the Nagara style you don't have any water body or something but as you compare it to the Dravida style there is always given high importance to the boundaries every temple in Dravida is uh, is going to have some big high boundaries along the structure and those temple boundaries is very popularly called as the Gopurams and also there is there is maximum possibility you have some kind of water structure some kind of water tank inside that particular complex that this is something very common that we find in Dravida and Nagara style and also you look at the third uh, this is the basic uh, structure you can see on your screens of northern and southern very clear comparisons we have made. Visara I told you it's a hybrid structure it has it has the features which is a blend of the two the Dravida and Nagara uh, temple uh, elements. It is, and since it's a hybrid, it lies within the areas which are uh, which are close to the central India and the Deccan regions of India. This Visara hybrid style was actually started by the Chalukyan rulers, but it reached its maximum peak. It, re it, it reached the peak of its uh, uh, in terms of uh, accomplishment during the Rashtrakuta period time. Now, whenever you are preparing for the art and culture, I would always suggest you guys do take care of the t these two dynasties. They have very rich history 
in terms of art and culture, specifically the temple architecture. One good example of Visara you can think of is the Hoysal temple. Now what was asked in the question, let's get back to the question once and there uh, let's see what the question was asking. Now this was a very straightforward question I told you, <clears throat> very easy one in fact. It, it was asking about the Nagra style having Shikhara, yes, Panchayatan style, we have just told you. Dravida style having Vimans, Gopuram and temple is having the boundary walls, yes, this is also absolutely correct. Visara is about the hybrid style featuring both the features. It, it was, it's a very easy question. You must attempt these kind of questions because temple architecture, you can't even think of skipping in art, art and culture. It is a must topic that you prepare. It's a very easy, straightforward, very, very important uh, topic that was asked. The second question was the match the following kind of stuff. Now UPSC is very fond of asking the match the following and you are supposed to tell me which, which particular, uh, uh, you know, there is one column is the art forms and the states. <clears throat> Every art form you must prepare along with the state names. That is the, that is the most important part you have to take care of. Be it any painting, any kind of art form, painting, dance, any kind of art form has to be associated with the state. Now like, let's say you, you are being asked about the Sita Kali. Sita Kali is basically an ancient folk art and that belongs to the state of Kerala, that is true. Kalarepattu is a, is a martial art form, but that is not prevalent in Tamil Nadu. That is also very, very ancient martial art form of India uh, in Kerala. So the, definitely the second one is not correct here. Chahu is a dance form. In India, uh, Chahu dance forms are performed in many states. Like uh, it is also in Jharkhand, but also in Odisha because Chahu dance form also has many variations, but definitely one variation belongs to Odisha, especially uh, during the festivals of the Onam, the people perform the Chahu dance. And last was Thangka. Thangka is basically, it's a painting guys. It's a, it's a Buddhist painting that is there in the state of um, Sikkim. Now, now third and fourth are also correct. Now be very careful, I'm going to tell you something very interesting here. This is Thangka, very similar, but well, there is one more art form called as Thangta. So don't, don't get confused. Thangta is a martial art form belonging to the state of Manipur. And this was Thangka as a Buddhist painting belonging to Sikkim. So two are very, very uh, uh, close to each other. So be very careful with the last two words that is going to make every difference. This is again a very easy uh, question. You must attempt it. Uh, of course, it's a fact based. There is no logic you can apply. If you are absolutely having no idea, then nothing can be done. But uh, as far as I understand, these art forms are very common, very easy, uh, something that you that you always listen here and there. And especially do take care of those art forms which are especially in the news in the last one or two years. Then you understand why UPSC is asking these kind of questions. So here the answer has to be three. That uh, C that is th all, uh, three pairs are correct barring the exception of the two. If you want to go by more details of these art forms, of course, you can refer to the PDF and uh, there you will get to know more of the details of these particular, uh, you know, uh, uh, these particular uh, uh, art forms, right? Now, if you, if you uh, going by the question number three, question number three is something that is about the Quit India Movement. Now, Quit India Movement very, very basic topic, very one of the most important movements in the freedom struggle of, of our country. So in whenever you are reading about modern history, modern history, freedom struggle is incomplete without the movements like Quit India Movement, non-cooperation, civil disobedience. They are the landmark pillars of the freedom struggle of India. And th then of course you have to be careful about these movements. You cannot skip them. You have to be very much, uh, very much uh, occupied with that. Now, we know that this particular movement is, has to do something with Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi is important figure in terms of uh, Quit India movement. It was that particular time he has given the, uh, you know, do or die slogan. Very, very famous slogan. Even it is used even in today's context, do or die, karo ya maro. So Mahatma Gandhi launched this movement from the, uh, at the Bombay session. Yes, this, there was a speech given by Mahatma Gandhi from, uh, from a very historic, um, you know, from a very historic maidan, from a very historic place uh, that is considered, that is called the Gowala Tank Maidan. Now, now after this particular moment, today it is known as August Kranti Maidan. That is important. Whenever you think of the, when you talk about the Quit India movement, uh, always or any other movement, be very careful with the sessions. 
uh, UPSC will definitely want you to know some of the historic sessions of the Indian National Congress. All important sessions whenever anything landmark is being done, they, you, have to be, you have to have a list of all important Congress sessions and anything which is significant that took place at that particular time. You talk about Quit India Movement guys, you must be aware of the Aruna Asif Ali, better known as the Grand Old Lady of India. She is also associated with this particular movement because she is the one that hoisted the Indian flag at the Gowala Tank Maidan during this particular movement only. And the particular, uh, this uh, uh, slogan called Quit India was actually given by Yusuf Meherali who was a socialist and a trade unionist, unionist okay. So these two, three figures are important. Also, you have to be aware of the immediate background of the Quit India movement. Basically, uh, it was the times of the World War II when the Britishers wanted the support of Indian staff. They wanted us to cooperate with them. And for that purpose, they have, uh, they have sent a mission called Cripps Mission under the chairmanship of Stanford Cripps. And uh, they, wanted to co they wanted our help, so they gave us some offer uh, in exchange. The main proposals of that Crip mission that came to India in 1942, they said, we will give you dominion status, you know, we will give you external internal autonomy, we will make a constituent assembly for you, we will uh, select the members, we will elect them to the provincial assemblies, like that. So many promises were there. But th by that time, because we are talking about 1942. I mean, after 1930s, the stand of the Congress and all major parties was clear. We want nothing but the complete independence, right? It was a, it was a historic Lahore session when we said we want complete independence. That is going to be our objective. I mean, we were asking dominion status way back when we were having 1916, when we were having the home rule movement, right? That time we were asking for that. 1942, there is no, uh, there is no chance we would settle with dominion. We wanted complete independence. That is why the Scripps mission was very much rejected by INC, by the Muslim League also. And uh, that is why uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi has, uh, you know, given a very famous line with respect to Cripps mission. Mahatma Gandhi said, it is like the post dated checks on a crumbling bank. And that is the kind of line which gets associated with the Cripps mission. That line is important. UPSC may ask that particular line to you as well. But like I said, all the every political community, every political party was not in support of the Quit India movement. There was Muslim League, there was Communist Party of India, in even the Hindu Mahasabha, Indian bureaucracy, and C. Ch Raja Gopalachari, who was a congressman, but not very much in favor of Quit India movement. They were the one who did not support the movement. That is also a truth that you have to consider. Now, if you go back to the question, look at the way question was asked. It was a straightforward question. I do not see any problem with the question, guys. Straight away, it is, it is uh, telling you the first statement being correct. Mahatma Gandhi launched Quit India Movement. Yes, uh, at the Bombay session. Sessions are important, like I told you. It was because of the failure of the Crips, Crips mission. Of course, the background was the failure of Crips mission. And uh, there was a widespread participation of the students, women, uh, worker, peasants. See, Quit India Movement was basically a leaderless movement. Why leaderless movement? Because the moment Quit India started, all important leaders uh, uh, of that time, they were basically jailed by the British government. Maximum leaders were into the jail. So it was a leaderless movement, but people kept it alive at their own level. And that is why you have a massive contribution by all these particular sections. It was more of a people's movement. The four statement is absolutely incorrect. We have seen Muslim League, Hindu Mahasabha, they did not support. They Op, uh, oppose this particular movement, they were not in support of that. So I think this was also a very easy question, straightforward, very expected kind of facts that you can expect of the Quit India movement are uh, there. So answer has to be C, only three. No, uh, nothing tricky in this particular question. It's a fact-based, straightforward question being asked to you guys. Question number four was about the Home Rule Movement launched by Any Besant, launched by Bal Ganga Tilak. Yes, Home Rule Movement is something we started 1916. That is absolutely correct. And Home Rule is again one of the very important movements that you will always prepare with the modern history. There is no chance skipping it. The, the inspiration for the Home Rule Movement was from the Ireland. It was the Irish uh, Home Rule Movement from where we took our inspiration. And two Home Rule Movements were there, one under Any Besant. Uh, she started somewhere in September 1916 and Bal Gangadhar Tilak started Home Rule a little bit earlier. It was April 
1916 when they started the movement. Of course, the area of operation of Bal Gangadhar Tirak was a bit restricted. Any basin area of operation was a, a bigger one if you if you look at that. And look at look at the detail first before I discuss it. So you 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 can see here the Tilak's movement was mainly restricted to Maharashtra, Central Provinces, and Berar and Karnataka. This is important uh, point. You you may be asked about the area of operations of the different uh, Home Rule movement. Where the any basin having 200 branches, it was a larger setup. It was for rest of the India, including the Bombay. Uh, there were two different different branches were there. Okay. Now, very importantly, what was the objective of this Home Rule movement? Now, in the Home Rule movement, these two leaders were asking for self-government, but within the British Empire. Now, this is what you call you can call as a dominion status, because it was 1916. Before uh, 1930, we were we were okay with that self-government within the British Empire. But later on, things have changed completely. So first statement is correct. And also something very important that you should know. Even this uh, Home Rule movement was also not officially supported by, uh, you know, Muslim League and Hindu Mahasabha. But some of their leaders were actively a part of Home Rule. Like for example, Muhammad uh, Ali Jinnah, member of Muslim League, was an active member. K.M. Munshi belonging to Hindu Mahasabha also was an active member of this particular movement. But officially their organizations did not support this particular movement. So if you, if you go back to the question what was asked. So first statement was a straightforward. Yes, it is about achieving dominion status. Dominion is same as self-government within the British Empire. So first statement is correct. But second, absolutely not correct. It said it officially supported by them. No, they, were, they did not support it, it officially. Of course, you can't remember every movement, but these are some landmark movements. These are some watershed movements in our freedom struggle. So at least about them, you have to be careful about who has supported them, who has not supported them. Something you have to be very accurate with the facts. I mean, this particular question I would say is also easy. You can attempt it by knowing some basic facts because uh, this is something history. You, in history, you can't do much of the logic. Of course, you have to be good with the facts. Okay. Now, next question, which was question number five. Question number five was about the tropical and extra tropical cyclones. Now, guys, I think this is very obvious and every, everyone knows that cyclones are the low pressure systems because without there has to be low pressure system, then only it can attract the wind from all directions. Only low pressure systems can make the winds converge. And that is the basic uh, uh, process of the beginning of the cyclones. Now, when I, when I use the word tropical cyclone, tropical cyclone means cyclones that are, uh, that, that are occurring specifically within Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, like 23 and a half degree north to 23 and a half degree south. So that particular area is called the tropical area. Cyclones within this particular area, of course, there is some exception. You will never find uh, uh, cyclones near the equator. At equator, you don't have Coriolis force. So of course, uh, equator plus minus 10, I mean, this areas you never ever have cyclones. Only this area and this area you will you are going to have tropical cyclones. They are low pressure systems, and tropical cyclones always form over the warm ocean water. That is one of their uh, requirement. You can say at least 27 degrees Celsius temperature is something that require minimum temperature for the formation of tropical cyclones. And uh, of course, they are driven by the trade winds. What are the trade winds? Trade winds are the one that actually flow from the subtropical high to the equatorial low pressure belt. So that's how they always like northeast trades and southwest trades. That's how uh, southeast uh, trades that that's how they go. Now, very, very importantly, the northeast trades and the southeast trades, since they also belong to the tropical region, that is approximately 30 degree north to 30 degree south. So within that you have the trade winds and that is why the tropical cyclones are going to be driven by the trade winds. It's very simple. You should just know the location. Tropical cyclone, the name suggests everything and a trade wind is one of the planetary winds that, you, that we have. You must have heard about the westerlies, the easterlies and the trade winds. These three are the major planetary winds that we have. First statement looks absolutely correct. There is no problem. Second says the extra tropical cyclones. Now what, what should be the meaning? Apply the logic. If tropical is within tropic, what would be extra tropical? Extra tropical is very similar to what you call as temperate cyclone, right? You can call it as a temperate cyclone. You can call it as a wave cyclone. You can call it also as a, uh, as a, what you say as the front cyclone also. You can call it as front cyclone as well. 
So extra tropical is basically which is outside the tropic. Simple meaning is outside the tropic. It is also low pressure. Cyclone has to be low pressure. But again, it is outside tropics. And, and since it is outside tropics and it involves the fronts, the basic uh, mechanism behind the trop extra tropical cyclone is that they are driven by the air fronts. So you have the air fronts, the cold air front, which is coming from the, uh, you know, polar pol uh, cold polar areas and the warm air mass, which is going from the below the warm air mass and the cold air mass, whenever they are going to converge, the cold air mass is going to enter the area of the warm sector. It is going to close down the entire warm air is going to leave that particular place, which is called occlusion uh, front. So all this happens in the extra tropical cyclone and, and since they are driven by air fronts, they can be or uh, they can uh, form over the land as well as the sea. That is the basic difference. Tropical cyclones only they are formed over the water bodies, only over the water, but extra tropical can be land, can be sea. This complete cycle is approx it's a six stage cycle of extra tropical cyclones. It's approximately 15 to 20 days process that is there. So first two statements are absolute, absolutely correct. Uh, I mean, very basic uh, topics about tropical, extra tropical. Then you have a question about the Fujiwara effect also. Now Fujiwara is a very interesting concept. Uh, you see, I, I want to show it on the on the picture once. So look at the, look at the uh, cyclone guys. So sometimes what happen if you have two cyclones very close to each other, if two cyclones are circulating nearby, there is always a tendency that the two are going to be drawn closer to each other. So Fujiwara effect is that which caused the two cyclones to merge into each other. Of course, uh, they, they will form a larger cyclone and there is always a chance of diversion of their original path that is called Fujiwara effect. So remember this particular effect, it has a direct connection to the to this uh, to the cyclones guys that that is very, very important. Okay. Now, if you look at the statements, First, second and third looks absolutely correct. It's a fact based question. Direct basic knowledge of geography is good enough. Look at the fourth one. Fourth one is talking about the names of the cyclone. Cyclone is the name that we use specifically for low pressure systems of Indian Ocean. But in the in the North Pacific, Eastern North Pacific and Caribbean, they are not called typhoons. Their name is called hurricanes. They are known by the name of hurricanes in Eastern North Pacific. They are called typhoons for the Western Pacific guys, Western Northern Pacific, specifically the areas of Philippines, China, Japan. In these areas, Western Pacific, the name is typhoon. Eastern North Pacific name is hurricane. Of course, you have other names of cyclone also. For example, near, near the Australian water, they are called as Willy Willy. So these names are very important. I mean, they are, they are not many. So I, I would suggest you to be uh, uh, factually correct. You have to think factually correct. There is absolutely no scope of guesswork here. It's a typical question of geography. You have to have good knowledge. But I would always suggest prepare the topic of cyclones very well. Very expected question. Direct questions come. So you should not be making mistake. I would say this is a medium kind of question. But I think by at least if you know the first three statements, you can still go with the guesswork. You can still figure out which statement is correct, which is not. I think you should risk these kind of questions because uh, you know 70-75% of the statement. So here the answer is only three, fourth being incorrect. Now uh, the next question was about question number and yeah there is a comparison in, in your PDF we have given a comparison of tropical extra tropical. Please go through that read about it you will always have information first hand available to you in your exam. And the sixth question was also about the two very interesting phenomena. Uh, of our geography. One is called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and El Nino Southern Oscillation which is called the ENSO. I mean I think you are not very well aware of the Pacific Decadal. It is not very much into the news because it's a, it's a very long term uh, uh, process. It's a long term phenomena. Basically both the Pacific Decadal and ENSO both these are climatic phenomena because it is about atmospheric and ocean uh, uh, you know how the oceans and atmosphere interact with each other. So in general, the PDO and ENSO is uh, oceanic atmospheric interactions with each other. And of course, you have heard of the ENSO. ENSO is something that you have heard, uh, uh, you know, having impact on Indian monsoon, at least you have heard of that. So if, if it, it impacts Indian monsoon, so definitely it, it is going to be related to the tropical regions. 
whereas the the pacific decadal ocean uh, oscillation is again uh, an atmospheric phenomena but that actually appears after let's say 10 to 20 years it's a long term phenomena, phenomena after any uh, after every 10 to 20 years uh, it appears it's a long term phenomena enso is quite shorter every 2 to 7 years we have the enso uh, one basic difference between the two was that pacific decadal is mainly related to the extra tropical uh, area it means it belongs to the area it mostly appears in that part of pacific which is somewhere around 30 to 60 degree north and south okay that is called extra tropical also called the temperate area and uh, enso lies in the tropics yes it is uh, something that you will have in 30 to 30 north and south 30 degree north to 30 degree south so that second statement makes wrong because uh, of course PDO is not going to be with tropic PDO is with extra tropic so first statement looks correct uh, second has a problem answer has to be a it's it's a difficult question it's a tough one I understand the two things are really really uh, uh, you know very deep topics of geography it's a tough one if you have if you have read them then you can risk it if you have absolutely no idea this is because here no chance of guesswork then I think you should skip because they are very hardcore topics of geography guesswork is not going to give you any help with respect to getting the right answer okay now you have the question number seven which the question number seven was about you you are supposed to figure out the correct one now it is about the land subsidence and the seismic zones okay now let's say if you have not really read about land subsidence otherwise though you should have read because land subsidence was in news recently some very uh, wrong something very wrong happened in the Joshi Mutt recently last year the Joshi Mutt land subsidence was very much in the news Joshi Mutt is a place in Uttarakhand now land subsidence as you translate the literal meaning English meaning if you translate you see land sub subsidence means downward vertical movement of the earth surface okay makes sense now you see land can be subsided land can move downwards by both reasons it can be natural it can be human factors absolutely no problem with this right the two things quite looks quite similar first I, I uh, this statement can be actually solved by a little bit of the common sense and by sim without panicking simply applying your uh, presence of mind you can solve it since I have I have told you about the land subsidence so you should be aware of the fact that land subsidence can naturally it can be because of dissolution of the limestone land can subside can sink down any volcanic activity can do that even tectonic deformation there is any tectonic upliftment downliftment any tectonic movement can make the land go down right even the glacial isostatic adjustments what exactly is that you know during the times of the ice age there was a lot of ice on the earth surface so earth was already subsided now since the uh, glaciers are melting earth is now the earth surface is uh, you know bouncing back to the original since the upper load has been redistributed and there are human factors also how humans can impact land subsidence of course too much extraction of groundwater oil gas minerals when you are doing too much of extraction or even you are doing mining you are basically creating a vacuum underground you have pulled out everything and there is always every chance of collapsing the underground cavities right even too much of construction construction was the major reason behind the Joshi Mutt land subsidence illegal over construction you are over exploiting you are creating heavy structures on a very uh, you know uh, sensitive land that always make the land go subside that is important thus as far as seismic zones are concerned now you, you can also look have a look at the picture you will understand how the land subsidence take place and the second part was about the uh, seismic zones of India okay uh, 2002 the government of India has given us this seismic map almost 60 percent approximately specifically is uh, this almost specifically 60 percent of India is vulnerable to the earthquakes and the entire India has been divided into four earthquake zones also called the seismic zones initially there was zone one also but then zone one and two were merged as together so now we have zone two to zone five zone five being the most vulnerable you have the you have the highest risk risk percentage is definitely at the highest at zone five zone 4 is something where you have the minimum risk okay this is how India is being divided into four seismic zones now if you come back to the question uh, we already have discussed the first part so first part is very much okay no problem with this 
Second is about the seismic zones classified four categories uh, based on intensity, frequency of the earthquakes, five being the most active, two being the uh, least one. I think both are correct. This is a very easy question. You can attempt it without any problem. Even if you have read basics about the earthquake management in India, then only you, you then even then you are able to solve the question. Okay. Now question number eight was uh, uh, with respect to the concurrent list. This is a very interesting uh, subject guys. Majorly you will have questions about the state list and the union list, but sometimes you also have questions on the concurrent list. Now that for that you need to go back to schedule seven in your constitution schedule seven uh, very specifically the, the constitution has mentioned that which particular subject on, on which subject which particular part of the government is going to make the law. There are certain subjects, there are certain issues on which only the central government can make the law and they are put under the union list. There are approximately 100 such uh, topics on which only the central government will make the law. Some you can have for the state government and there is a state list. Approximately 66 subjects are there. And then there are some subjects, some issues on which even central government as well as state government both can make the law. Both are, uh, you know, compact, both are capable of making the law. In case of there is any kind of uh, conflict, if center state both has made the law, then most likely the central law is going to prevail. But in case the state wants its point to be heard, then what happens if there is only, if, if state has made a law in the concurrent list and there is any chance of contradiction with the, with the central law, then after passing the law, after making the law, they will send, they have to send it to the president. And then president of India gives, if, if they give the assent, uh, if they give the, uh, uh, you know, assent to the bill, then the state law is going to prevail rather than the central law. That is the provision that we have so far. Now, if you look at the question, guys, if it is uh, in the question, it was said, the state government needs the parliament approval before making the law. It says before making the law on concurrent list. No, it, there is no such provision. Yes, you need president approval is fine, but it's not mandatory that even before making a law, the permission is required after you make the law, after you pass it at the state level, then it is sent to the, to the president for the approval. Now, again, such questions, such uh, words before, after, only, all, you really have to be little careful. And always try to read the statement with utmost attention. Sometimes we read it like that. Uh, sometimes we skip the basics. Don't do that. Very Each and every word needs to be read very carefully in UPSC exam. First is absolutely fine. Second says, uh, 42nd amendment uh, transferred the subject education from state to concrete. Yes, 42nd amendment is the one we call as mini constitution of India. And this mini constitution of India, uh, not just the education, education, forest, you know, education, forest and many other laws were actually state subject, but they were made concurrent so that the center has some power on their legislation. So here both sub, both are, uh, the first one is not correct, of course. The first statement is wrong. Second is correct. So answer has to be B. I think this particular is a medium uh, a kind of uh, question. Uh, you should risk it. At least the sec I expect you guys that second statement is something you should be aware of. First, you make, may make a little bit mistake, but still go for it, risk it, uh, but be careful about reading. Then you may apply some logic. Okay, this can be done after, this can be done before, that kind of thing. When it comes to the concurrent list, please remember the 42nd Amendment Act has, pro, has uh, made education, forest, protection of the wildlife animals, weights measures, administration of justice, constitution, organization of the all courts, except for the Supreme and High Court. They were all put under the concrete list. But be careful, Supreme Court, High Court are not covered under this jurisdiction. They are dealt separately, guys. Okay. Now, question number nine was a question on sickle, uh, sickle cell anemia. This is a very, very important topic of sickle cell anemia. And uh, here you were supposed to figure out which particular statements are not correct, which statements are not correct here. That is something you have to talk about. So be careful if they are asking about you the correct one or the non-correct one. Okay. Now, if you are, if you are, if you have never heard of this uh, disease, then of course it becomes very difficult to solve it. If you are absolutely no clue about it, then please skip it because this is a hard fact-based question. You can't do any guesswork here. 
first let me make you understand about the sickle cell anemia which is a genetic disease which is passed from the parents to the children what is a sickle cell anemia there is a mutation of the genes that's why i'm calling it as a genetic disease so what happens guys in very in, in a normal person you have the red blood cells rbcs the shape of the rbcs is very much circular now this circular shape is very good because uh, the circular shapes can easily float with from our uh, within our arteries and veins without any trouble and very easily they can float and they they will they don't make any problem the blood flow is okay but in the sickle cell anemia condition the shape of the rbcs change rather than being oval or circular they become crescent shape something like that that is the shape of the rbcs that that shape got modified now you see if the shape has become like a sickle like sickle is something that you know which is used to cut the crops so sickle cell means the shape of the rbc is now crescent shape now you can very well understand if there is something having this kind of shape do you think with this shape the blood flow becomes easy no the blood flow becomes slow rbcs are always going to you know uh, you know slow down each other and the the worst part can be it can lead to blocking blood flow causing the pain organ damage and even anemia anemia is basically where you have where you have uh, less hemoglobin in you where you have less uh, blood in you that is called the anemia lack of blood is something you call as anemia right so that is what that's why the name is sickle cell anemia now please uh, uh, keep this anemia word into mind and please apply the logic if there is a condition of anemia do you think there is any chance that the amount of the iron is going to increase in the blood no anemia itself means there is there is more chronic loss of blood you already have less blood in you that is why you are anemic so there is no chance that an anemic person is going to have high iron in the blood hb cannot be high for a anemic person if that is the case he is not he or she is not anemic at all right so this is something you have to be very care about every sickle cell anemia patient is going to have less iron in their blood because there is excessive blood loss that is always there this particular disease is considered to be an autosomal recessive disease why it is called autosomal recessive disease because both parents like father and mother both should have at least one single sickle cell gene then only it can be passed to their children so that is called the autosomal disease now you look at this picture this this will make make the things bit more clear to you look at this particular picture now that is how the sickle cell is transmitted to the children so here you have a father having one normal gene one is called sickle cell if both parents have at least one sickle cell gene then there are chances they may have a normal baby also but in majority of the cases they are going to have a sickle cell anemia uh, anemic patient if the child is going to have both Uh, uh, genes from father mother as sickle cell trait okay of course uh, you can have the replica of the two but yes the both the parents has to have the condition and to tackle this uh, sickle cell problem guys see after uh, pradhan mantri narendra modi in his man ki baat uh, episode i think one or two year back he spoke about the sickle cell anemia because in india in the tribal population this particular disease is very uh, very much prevalent so 2023 for the sake of helping the tribal population of the country we started national sickle cell anemia elimination program our target year is 2047 by which we want to eliminate this disease it's a it's a public health program being run in india to tackle the sickle cell okay now coming back to the question once now you can see the statements here very simple statements sickle cell anemia but this is a hard fact question again if you are not aware of the facts you can't do any guess work here the blood cells become crescent shape yes they become they can block so first it made is correct second now be very careful it says it increases the amount of the blood no if it is anemic condition this these two are contradictory if it is anemia it cannot increase the amount of the iron in the blood that always loss of blood going to decrease the amount of iron second is wrong third is autonomous uh, autosomal disease yes and fourth was the sickle cell elimination program 2047 now be very careful with the with the numbers i mean which particular there are some programs going to eliminate things by 2030 some programs 2025 some uh, program 2047 at least be careful about the starting and the target year of any program which is happening 
at a global level at a pan india level you have to be careful about so here i can see uh, now which statement is not correct it is asking so only one statement is not correct uh, i think this is tough one you risk it only if you know have some information otherwise it's better to skip because there is no point taking risk of these particular questions okay now going forward guys going forward with the next question question number 10 Now question number 10 was about considering the statements about the national strategic plan for tuberculosis elimination. Now this question is important because India is considered to be having one of the largest burdens of TB in our country. Tuberculosis which is uh, which is a bacterial infection uh, which is caused by mycobacteria. Uh, now this this topic is important and again it for attempting this kind of question you really have to be good with the facts because any mission any program any government schemes cannot be solved based on the guess work so tb is important in india we have a huge burden tb is infectious disease it's a bacterial infection caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis and india has a huge burden of that now very importantly specifically to tackle the drug resistant tb drug resistant tb is the one where you have antimicrobial resistance the body is not able to respond to the normal vaccines and normal drugs and medicines which are uh, there already there to treat the normal tb if that conditions happen then it becomes really challenging to treat or cure any person if the person is having drug resistant bacteria inside so for tackling that drug resistant tb we have started this particular program it was from 2017 to 2025 because in india we have a target we we have set a target by 2025 we are going to eliminate this tb now global target is 2030 but india wants to eliminate tuberculosis way 5 years before it but please may, let me make you understand when i say uh, elimination of tb in india elimination here does not mean zero cases in india the definition of elimination of tb means that there should be less than less than 44 new tb cases for every 1 lakh population if we are able to make it that down then it is considered to be almost eliminated so be aware i am not saying about zero new cases less than 44 new cases per 1 lakh is considered to be achieving this goal now please remember with respect to tuberculosis management very very important declaration has been signed in india called the gandhi nagar declaration now this declaration was signed by 11 member countries specifically of the who south east asian region and they also wanted to contribute and endorse this particular model all the success that india has achieved so far even these countries were were uh, you know they were curious about joining that particular thing if you come back to the question you see this is a fact based question first statement looks fine it is it says national strategical plan for tuberculosis elimination about preventing management of drug drug uh, resistant this is this is important this program is not about normal tb it is specifically targeting the drug resistant tb that we have mentioned guys second statement says uh, aligned with the gandhi nagar declaration yes we have just seen that gandhi nagar declaration is important and it is about to accelerate the response to end the tb by 2025 and gandhi nagar declaration you may have a question separately on gandhi nagar declaration as well i mean there there are no not many gandhi nagar declaration so at least try to remember this declaration has relation to tuberculosis that you can help so second statement is correct even third is also correct we have the target 2025 5 years ahead of the global target so yes i see all the three are correct now this question i would say this is a this is a bit tough question you can risk it if you know at least two of the three statements if you have absolutely no clue nothing you can do you have to skip because it's a hard fact based question and these question needs to be attempted very carefully because they are actually something that can give you negative marks question number 11 was about you have to you have four commissions in front of you every commission is about some very important legislation all are famous commissions like you have balwant rai mehta commission raj mannar venkat Ch chali and sarkari commission but the question was about which of them talk about avoiding conferring statutory power to the governors now in that case whenever there is anything related to the statutory power of the governor always remember two commissions one sarkariya commission and another is called the panchi commission total hard fact based question no guesswork but always remember 
at least and, and specifically because given the given the present scenario you know that the governor is very much in news i mean every day or two there is something related to governor that comes to the news and in present scenario government topic the governor topic has become very important guys so i really want you to prepare this topic and expect 200 percent some question will pop up on governor maybe it's power it's uh, relation with the with the with the central government uh, you know it's discretionary powers or the commissions related to it so i suggest you guys to prepare for the governor very expected topic given it is coming too much in the news these days it was a tough question because it's a factual question if you have not read it then you, you have to skip it even if you are able to figure out at least uh, at least you have a 50 50 situation if you know some of them you don't know some of them then you can risk it but otherwise it's a fact based question you have to be 200 percent sure because it's not about just the governor it's about the statutory powers of the governor okay now the details you can definitely read about sarkaria commission what exactly was there similarly you have the you have this particular commission other commissions are there so in pdf we have given everything which is required but just to give you another uh, dimension balwant rai committee has something to do with the panchayati raj system so clearly not something to do with the governor that you can uh, skip out for sure rest you have to be careful about question number 12 was again a very fact based question it says which of the following drugs are who recommended first line hiv treatment for adults and adolescents you have to tell me which is which drug relates to hiv treatment now here i will go with the elimination method how i can go with elimination see i'm not aware let's say i have no idea about which but at least i have i have read about some of the famous drugs i know about uh, rifem uh, rifem uh, pycin i know about the isoniazid because both the, both of them are the standard drugs we use for the tuberculosis management in india and same is the case with the third one it also belongs to the tb uh, 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 disease it belongs to the treatment of tuberculosis so at least if i can eliminate these two and if i have a confusion i can still risk this kind of question of course it's a tough one if i have no clue at all then there is no point attempting it it's a straight suicide kind of thing because uh, guesswork is going to give you negative marks most of the time the right answer has to be uh, d it is the tld pill which is there for the hiv treatment now very simple uh, like how i remember it three letter hiv three letter for the tld so you have the three three combination that way you can remember three uh, letter disease for the three letter pill that i that i can relate it i can remember it it's a shortcut that i can tell you about this particular uh, pill the tld it stands for tenofovir it stands for lamivudin and you have the dolu trigger so these are the three names it's a fixed three disease three uh, uh, medicines fixed dose combination which is in short called for the tld pill given to the hiv patients very very important okay rest three belongs to the hiv uh, sorry rest three belongs to the, to the tuberculosis i hope this much is clear to everyone now if i if i move ahead with the question number 13 Question number 13 was about the BRICS. BRICS is very, very important. I think this is something we all have heard about. BRIC grouping is something India is always associated to. And this is, this is a group of five countries having almost, uh, they are the five most emerging economies of the world today. They are the futures of the geopolitics. And these five countries are Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. The members, you cannot make any blunder in that. You have to remember the name of the BRICS. It was in news recently. Why it was in news recently? Because it has recently expanded itself and it has added six new members. Now look at the question guys. Look at the question it says about the BRICS and look at the member it has told. Is it, is it, does it include Bangladesh? Absolutely not. Is it Sri Lanka? Absolutely not. Because Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, nowhere, they are not considered as an emerging economies. It is Brazil and South Africa. So first statement is absolutely no correct, not correct at all. Now about the expansion, because it was in the news, so BRICS has recently expanded and it has added six new countries, out of which one country is from South America, that is very uh, friendly country of Brazil. Brazil football, remember Argentina football, both are football nations, so two countries from South America we have. Similarly, you have, you have uh, 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 only South Africa was there from the Africa, 
Now you have two more countries from Africa, one Egypt, one is called Ethiopia. Even Ethiopia is being added as a part. Now, now we have three African countries in BRICS. And then we have the three remaining members from the Middle East, that is West Asia, Iran, Saudi Arabia and UAE. These six members are there. Turkey is not a member. You have to remember any recent expansion of any important group, you have to remember you have absolutely no chance. Now first, uh, first and fourth statements looks absolutely wrong. Now comes the uh, second and third statement. Look at look the two things very carefully. It says BRICS grouping has created a common currency. Absolutely not. No emerging economy is going to have a common currency because every country, BRICS, every country, India, China, Russia, they are all promoting their own currencies. Why would they have a common currency when they, their own currency is very much in the demand, right? So that, may, that makes a logic, okay, that looks a bit defaulty. They are not going to have a common currency. We are not, we are not going to have a Eurozone kind of system in India, no. It will hurt our dom domestic in, uh, uh, currency because every, the, all these currencies are very powerful. India, China, Russia, their own currencies are very powerful uh, currencies. They don't need any common currency. So you can eliminate that because it was saying that BRICS Pay is a common currency. What is a BRICS Pay? It's a digital payment platform. Here basically all these countries, they can, they can simply pay each other in their national currencies and this digital platform payment settlement platform that actually does all the calculations and this and that. So it's a digital payment platform, not a common currency. The main objective why BRICS Pay was created just to reduce the dominance of the US dollar because all these five countries believe in de-dollarization. They want uh, dependence on dollars to be reduced so that their own currencies become more strong. So definitely no chance of common currency. By common sense, I can eliminate it at all. So three statements are absolutely correct. The only statement which is correct here is with respect to the new development bank. Yes, BRICS has uh, got, uh, got its own development bank. It was 2014. After the Fort Leza declaration, they have made their own bank. And this bank is basically to give financial technical assistance to its members and also to other developing countries, especially the countries of Asia Pacific countries and they give loan. It's a multilateral development bank. So yes, the third statement is the only one that is correct. So if I go by that logic, very simply, I can eliminate something. But of course, I need to have facts also, especially with respect to expansion. I have to be very good with the current affairs and the names. So here the answer has to be one. Um, I would say it's a medium kind of question because at least BRICS is very famous organization. I expect you guys to know a bit about BRICS. Uh, you can't skip these kind of topics. And I think you should risk, risk it uh, based on some information and some guesswork that can be done, guys. Okay. Now, moving ahead with the question number 14. Now, this question number 14 was about the Indus Water Treaty. Indus Water Treaty originally signed 1960 between India and Pakistan, brokered by World Bank that particular time. So, what as the name says, Indus Water Treaty. So, you know about the Indus Water System. You know we have this river Indus. Then you have five important subsidiaries in the name of Jhelum, Chenab, Ravi, Bias, and Satluj. Now, if you if you know the six river system, so technically, very uh, if you know if you know the geography of that Indus drainage, you know the three, the Indus, Chenab, and uh, Jhelum. These three rivers, which are called the western rivers of uh, the system, they belongs to Pakistan because of their closer geographical proximity to the Pakistan. Their water is going to be used by uh, majority part is going to be used by Pakistan. Only India has right over 20% of that water and that too for creating a runoff dam. You can't do any diversion. You can simply create a runoff dams here for the purpose of irrigation, for the purpose of uh, electricity generation, that's, that's all. Recently, these dams were in the news. If you have heard of the Kishan Ganga Dam, if you have heard of the Ratale Dam, these two are very important dams India is creating on uh, Kishan Ganga and uh, Chenab River and Pakistan is objecting on that. And at the, every time it gives reference to Indus Water Treaty. But of course, India has been uh, allowed for creating these dams. And the remaining three, the eastern three rivers, uh, technically, geographically, these three becomes eastern rivers. They belong to India. Okay. Now, if you have this much information, you know about Indus Water Treaty something because it's a very, it's a, it's a, uh, it, it is a kind of treaty which was in news recently where um, Prime Minister Modi has given a very landmark statement and after the terrorist attacks on Uri and Pulwama, he said, 
water and blood cannot run together it was a warning for pakistan we will stop your water if you will not stop the bloodshed so that was a very strong statement given by the pradhan mantri modi so the first statement says that uh, indus water treaty allocate three eastern rivers to india fine we have got the eastern river but apply your geography do you think jhelum and chenab are the eastern river no the both belongs to the western part the three eastern are satluj byas and ravi so geographically this statement is wrong now second and third for these two you need to have little bit information about indus water treaty but in case you have absolutely no idea let me give you how to attempt this question always remember any bigger treaty something of indus water treaty or something like that always going to have some mechanism to resolve the dispute in case of indus water uh, treaty there is a permanent indus commission which is there to resolve the dispute if there is any dispute between india and pakistan now second looks correct and third is also correct because in um, in in this uh, dispute resolution mechanism it is it is said that india pakistan is going to have this indus water treaty is going to have resolution at the three different stages and what are the three these three different levels uh, the very first level we have the permanent indus commission where each other party can simply submit their objections uh, with respect to each other if at the first level differences are not resolved then you can go to the next level that is you can go to the world bank which is a mediator in the treaty and uh, uh, world bank will appoint a neutral expert to resolve the differences between the two countries if even that fails then the third and the last option is the court of arbitration there you have to go and whose chair is to be appointed by the world bank again so it's a three step arbitration process that is being uh, applied now i understand the first uh, statement is logical that you can resolve second third needs a bit of technical information answer here is c 2 and 3 it's a medium question i think you should risk it don't skip it uh simply you can go with your guts you can you can uh, you know you can uh, understand treaties needs some resolution disputes so yes you can uh, attempt it no problem in that but first statement has to be incorrect guys okay question number 15 very very important format of statement 1 and 2 kind of thing now upsc is very keen to ask these kind of uh, questions Question number one says. Statement one says India is a party of 1951 refugee conventions. Wait, wait, wait. Alert. Is India ever going to be a party of refugee conventions? Because refugee conventions are talking about protecting the interest of the refugees. India is a country already having a problem of illegal migration. We already to weed out the illegal uh, immigrants in India. That is why the government of India has got the NRC, National Register of Citizens. that is why we have the uh, national population register why do we have these kind of uh, uh, provisions because in india we have not signed any refugee conventions we already are dealing with illegal migrants because if we sign it then it becomes obligatory on india to take care of all the illegal migrants because india cannot afford india is already 140 crore how many more people you want to come to india so very logically india cannot india is not in favor of any refugee convention so statement one absolutely wrong but at the same time india is considered as a humanitarian country right we respect the human rights we value the life of the people that is why india host refugees from the neighboring state at least especially from uh, uh, afghanistan from myanmar we give them refugee temporary or something like that because we believe in our neighborhood first policy we respect the people the life of our neighbors so that is why we do that on a humanitarian basis we respect the unhrc mandate which is united nation human commission rights we we respect that but we will never sign anything uh, something of the refugee convention so statement one wrong second looks quite good because that that something is india all about uh, i think it's a medium one but still you can risk it the answer has to be d one incorrect two correct by logic you can solve it even if you have never ever read about it so over a period of time if you are if you are reading the current affairs of course you will get this much idea okay uh, something that india is going to do or something india is not going to do that you will get an idea by practicing more and more questions next question you are supposed to figure out the correct statement now next statement is about some of the groupings now three important groupings were there in the question one was the quad then you have the i2 u2 and you have the exercise malabar now all the three are very very important uh, you know 
all important groupings that India is a part of. Now, when, when it comes to Asia, you know, these days, Indo-Pacific region is very much in the news. You know that there is a Chinese threat. There is always a Chinese, Chinese threat to the region. And for the sake of prosperity, for the sake of neutrality, for the sake of, uh, uh, you know, seamless trans transportation in the Indo-Pacific region, for all free trade and free movement, the Indo-Pacific region needs to be free from Chinese threat because China is a, is a country flexing, flexing its muscles and always a threat on the, uh, the free navigation, free movement in the Indo-Pacific, especially, especially after the South China Sea dispute that China has started. Now, in order to, uh, you know, make this region free and, you know, reduce and counter the Chinese presence, uh, the four countries, the Quad members were formed. The Quad is a basically a strategic dialogue uh, group. You have some uh, strategic interest, you have some defense military uh, aspect to that. Very commonly, this is called as Asian, Asian NATO. I don't agree to it much because NATO is altogether a different phenomenon. It's a collective security group. There is nothing like that in India. I wish it was more of a NATO kind because here the four countries, Quad is basically four. So, US, India, Japan, Australia, they have made this partnership, dialogue partnership, where their objective is clear to talk about the open, stable and prosperous Indo-Pacific region to make the things inclusive and resilient. In nutshell, they all together, they want to counter the China. But of course, it's not, it, it, it is not about collective security. If, if uh, maybe in future, if India is under threat, India is under attack. We don't really guarantee that all the three will come and rescue us. There is no guarantee. But as of now, Quad is one of the most important groups that India has to counter China, specifically in the maritime zone, especially in the, in the, in the oceans. It is one of the most important group that India is a part of Quad. Of course, China doesn't like it. To tease China more, these four countries together also conduct exercise Malabar. This Malabar exercise is also about these four countries. It's a multi-level naval exercise and uh, they involve, uh, you know, coordinated patrols and all the other stuff they do. Uh, annually, it's an annual exercise that is being done. Again, to make the world understand, Indo-Pacific is a free region. First and sec third are correct. Then there is another important group. Again, group of four countries called I2U2. I2U2 is a group where India, Israel, USA, but not U. UK, it is UAE, because you see I2U2 is, is called as a West Asian Quad. It is considered to be a Quad of West Asia. Now, UK definitely is not going to be part of that. So, India, Israel, USA and UAE, these four have made this group. And the major objective of this particular grouping was the cooperation, spe especially in the fields of space, transportation, technology and health. That is why I2U2 was made. Now, you also have got a question, I think 2022 or something, even in the mains exam, this question was asked. Okay, now very, very important, uh, this, uh, this particular dialogue was. So, now you see the question, I would say it's a medium question. There is not very, uh, not any, and nothing challenging because these four, three are already very popular groups and I would say it's medium one, it's an easy one rather and you should always attempt it. I mean, there is nothing you can do with the guesswork if you are not aware of these uh, groups, then there is no point taking the risk because everything is very much fact based. Then the question number 17 is very, very, very recent, uh, uh, you know, legislation that was passed in India. And it is with respect to the criminal justice system in India. Whenever you talk about criminal justice system of India, you have the IPC, uh, you have the criminal procedure called, called the CRPC and the Indian Evidences Act. Now, these three acts, which were already there in, in India, last parliamentary session, the government has proposed and passed three new bills that is going to replace the old ones and now we have got the new criminal justice system in India and very importantly that one is called Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita rather than IPC now we have got the Bharati Nyaya Sahita it is going to replace the IPC yes it is going to replace it and plus very importantly two very important things that been added in Bharati Nyaya Sahita so far, IPC was always very unclear about how to define a child. And in some laws, child is up to 16 years. In other many laws, child is up to 18. But now, Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita has clarified 
that in India child means any person below the 18 year of age. Now from this point onwards no confusion child means 18 year or less plus for the first time even Bharti Nyay Sahita for the first time has recognized transgender as a another gender. So now you have a form called male, female or a transgender. So you have the three columns as you whenever you have to mention the sex or gender in that particular form. So this these are the two very progressive things started by the Bharti Nyay Sahita. Number one is correct. Second is about Bhartiya Sakshya Abhinandan which is which replaces the Indian Evidence Act very importantly and why it was required guys. See so far uh, any any crime the evidences are very important and so far electronic and digital evidences were not considered to be part of the process. But now this particular because we are living in 2024 now obviously there will be a lot of electronic and digital records that must be used as an evidence and now for that sake this particular act was replaced and Bhartiya Sakshya Abhinandan has now got us this new electronic and digital records to be uh, administered as a primary evidence. You can use them as a primary evidence and you can proceed the case against the offenders. Now third statement is again important. It says Bharti Nyay Saita, the same uh, replacement of the IPC. It removed the term sedition. Sedition was the law which was 124A in the IPC and sedition uh, is something you call as Raj Dro. Sedition is something where you are going to do any uh, you know unlawful act against the well established government. But now sedition term is been removed but there is a, another provision very similar to sedition which says that if anybody is doing anything that endangered the sovereignty unity integrity of India we are going to punish that person for the sake of stability of the country for the sake of our uh, you know law and order of course we are going to punish it up to the seven year but the, but the term sedition has been removed completely that has been removed sedition term has been removed because obviously sedition is something which was there in Indian penal code way back in 1860 and sedition is something which was which was very much uh, used by the Britishers over the Indian freedom fighters. So also the government said we want to shed all the colonial history and we want to make the laws as per Indian needs and that is why the provision is there. So yes here we have the third one is also correct all three are correct. I would say this is a question which require very good understanding. It is a tough question. You can risk it if you have heard about it. If you have absolutely no law, if you have absolutely no clue about it, don't attempt because there is nothing guess you can do. You can skip in that particular case. But of course the guys, I expect you guys to read about these kind of things. If something is happening at a greater level, these are, these are the kind of current affairs you should always be preparing. Any major law, any major legislation or any major amendment that is coming, you must and must read about it. That is very, very important guys. Now question number 18 that we were, uh, that you were being asked. Now you, the question number 18 was about violation of the competition law during the merger acquisition. Now, so basically you have to guess the term, which term is about the competition law and um, uh, you know which term is about violate, violating the com, uh, com, uh, competition law whenever there is a merger or acquisition of the companies. So there are four words which are being given. Uh, can it be insider trading? No because see insider trading we have we have already learned about it many times. It has something to do with the stocks. It has something to do with the with the stock market. You know? uh, insider trading is when basically we get the information prior uh, before anybody else get that. It's an illegal way of getting the insider uh, information. It's a punishable, regulated by SEBI. I mean you can't get insider information and cannot be used uh, in, in manipulating the stocks. That should not be done. So clearly it is nothing to do with the merger acquisition of the, uh, of the, of the, of this companies. Moonlighting, it was in news many times and moonlighting is also not the case. Because moonlighting is when you are doing two jobs, you are hiding the other job uh, from the per, from your boss of the first job. You are doing two jobs simultaneously, and uh, there is a conflict of interest. Let's say if I am a if I am a software developer and I am I have joined two companies. One I am doing as a full time job. One I am doing as a part time freelancer job. I am creating the same kind of coding for the two companies. Of course, it's a conflict of interest. And my first boss is not aware about my second job that is called moonlighting. It is it was it was in news very much with respect to 
uh, you know the people who are uh, driving ola also driving uber also you know because both are competitors so that is there and price fixing of course price fixing is also not uh, it is violation of the competition law that is true but what is price fixing when uh, in 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 the market the main big players they want to establish their monopoly so they fix the prices of something and ultimately consumers are going to you know suffer for example you have the airtel and you have the jio the two major telecom companies if let's say they fix okay this is our fixed plan yeah you take it or you go home of course consumer have no choice price fixing is always about establishing monopoly violating the competition definitely but it has nothing to do with the merger and acquisition in that case i am not aware about it but at least my common sense is going to help me to eliminate this question i can eliminate something that i know is not going to be the answer so i'm only left with a choice called gun jumping it's a it's a tough question i i agree but i think you should risk it if you are able to eliminate if you can't eliminate definitely a big uh, uh, question it's a tough question for you if you want to read more about the gun jumping uh, it is always used as violation of the competition law especially in the merger and acquisition deals gun jumping can be of various form like for example uh, implementing transactions before the clearances that is a gun jumping kind of thing if you are sharing some confidential information if you are aligning the prices strategies uh, you know that that can also be uh, cause of gun jumping and yes uh, in in our laws we have severe penalties anybody doing that you have senior severe penalties also for that okay the question number 19 now 19th question was about uh, it is about the pm vani now this is a government scheme and in government schemes also you don't have any choice of the guesswork because um, it there are pure fact based questions so any if you are getting any question based on the uh, on the government schemes there is absolutely nothing you can do you really have to be aware of the scheme because it's a fact based scheme similarly pm vani what this pm vani is all about first let's understand that then we'll come back to the question so what this pm uh, vani is all about the pm vani vani here stands for public wifi hotspots the pm vani is about providing broadband internet services through the public wifi hotspots and that you can go to any public place you simply have to download the vani app and you can access the free wifi hotspot over there without any fees no license no registration nothing and anybody anybody can do that anybody under the pm vani scheme can actually set up their own public wifi and that is why anybody whosoever set up public wifi hotspot can actually become a public data office i mean literally any small business any shopkeeper can start this public wifi services right so that is the case with the pm vani now, now one every time i i mention whenever you are reading about any um, any scheme always be aware about the ministry similarly the pm vani scheme is under ministry of communication but maintained by which particular department it is the center for development of telematics called the c dot the c dot is responsible for creating and maintaining all the central registry all the databases of these public data office and everything related to pm vani so be aware of that and then let's go let's jump to the question guys first two statements are absolutely straightforward no problem in that first two are absolutely okay the problem lies with the third one it says it is maintained by tri telecom regulatory authority of india no absolutely no we have just read that pm vani is about the c dot it has nothing to do i mean this is confusing i know i mean because in india lot of lots and lots of regulations are done by the tri telecom regulatory authority of india it is responsible for many services but in case of the pm vani it is not the tri it is this one it, it this question is again a tough one Uh, only risk it if you know at least two out of the three. If you are not about not aware of the two at least, then you should skip it because no scope of uh, any guesswork. It's a direct question, uh, factual question. You can't do much about it. And similarly, the question number twenty. One more question on the on the government scheme, which is Pradhan Mantri Uchhtar Siksha Abhiyan, called PM Usha. Very very important scheme, guys. now again you have to have a basic knowledge about it and then only you can go and talk about this particular scheme so what this pm usha scheme is all about you remember before we have we have got our national uh, education policy in 2020 we have got our national education policy 
and after 2020 national education policy the earlier scheme called rusa which is rashtriya uchhtar shiksha abhiyan that rusa scheme which was launched way back in 2013 that was actually revamped as pm usha scheme so rusa was there already before 2020 but now rusa has become pm usha it's a central sponsored scheme and pm usha scheme is all about providing funding to the higher educational institution so two things you have to remember pm usha is a revamped form of rusa and it is about providing funding to the higher education institutions number one point is clear please remember any state any state who wants to implement this scheme first has to sign an mou with the ministry of education and they must say that i am going to implement the national education policy 2020 please remember why states consent are important remember i just told you we have we have done that education is a concurrent subject education is a concurrent subject where center and state both have a say so any any particular scheme who wants to get the benefit of pm usha has to first implement national education policy for that he has to sign memorandum of understanding then only he will be eligible to get the benefits but please remember pm usha is not going to discriminate between government and government aided institutions pm usha is going to cover both be it the government uh, institution even the government aided institution both are going to be financed unlike the rusa rusa the earlier scheme was only about the government institutions but pm usha is about both government as well as non uh, as well as government aided schemes and please remember about the pm usha uh, this particular scheme uh, it, it aims to establish even the new model degree colleges if in any area there is no government or uh, government aided institute institutions then we are going to set up new model colleges in that particular area so it it gives a chance of opening up new degree colleges as well because pm usha has five important components it talks about equity initiative quality initiative that in higher education there has to be equity everyone should be included there has to be quality education even it talks about research and innovation in the higher studies infrastructure development is important now this is an example of infrastructure development we are going to open up new model degree colleges and it also talks about management monitoring evaluation and research it's a very comprehensive scheme uh, which is now being operated under ministry of education under the new education policy if you come back to the question guys i mean first statement looks absolutely okay no problem with that look at the second statement it says the pm usha covers only the government scheme now you have just seen it pm usha is about government also government aided both are covered only was the case with the rusa not with this now this is an extreme statement you can simply eliminate it you can simply put a cross on that third and fourth looks absolutely fine without any problem you have straight away we have seen that so yes uh, the answer has to be only three i i know this is a tough question if you are not aware very difficult but you can risk you can you should risk this kind of question if you know at least two or three statements you know 50 70 percent then you can go for it otherwise skip it very difficult question to attempt but uh, you can go by the logic you can you can think about it if you have read anything about it then you can you can risk it but not always so these are the first 20 questions we have discussed and now uh, i hope you have enjoyed the video you have learned a lot of new things in this particular video i'll see you guys in the part number two where i'll be taking up the next 20 questions this is all from my side in this class signing off ashish malik take care and best wishes for your upsc 2024 see you guys in the next video take care jahid